Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name is Ali Al Sharif, and I'm a steering committee member here at ACE. Uh, ACE is a global community of machine learning practitioners and researchers who have gathered around topics in AI uh, research, engineering, and products. We have a repository of YouTube videos that showcase authors presenting their research and practitioners demonstrating the use of emerging machine learning methods in the field. We also host social events where you get a chance to uh, network and interact with fellow community members. Uh, finally, we conduct uh, workshops focused on helping participants take machine learning concepts from foundational theory all the way to uh, fully deployed models. Uh, we have multiple streams organized around specific topics, and, uh, and the presentation today covers two streams, uh, machine learning in cybersecurity and machine learning model interpretability. We encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out our website at ai.science. I will now turn it over to Igjit to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Ali. Hello, everyone. My name is Igjot Seni, and I'm also a steering committee member at ACE. Today, we are hosting Dr. Shireen Matthews. And Dr. Shireen Matthews is a senior data scientist with, within the office of the CDO for McAfee. In this role, she creates and develops new machine learning models to improve and increase the effectiveness of cybersecurity products. Sharon is a reputed and requested industry speaker on her research papers in areas of signal and image processing, machine learning, computer vision, artificial intelligence, and cybersecurity. Prior to her role at McAfee, Sharon held research positions at Canon Inc. and uh, Intel Corporation. She has a BSCE degree with honors from the University of Mumbai and a MS in Electrical and Computer Engineering focused in signal processing and wireless communication from State University of New York, College of Buffalo. Um, additionally, Sharon has a MSE in uh, Software Engineering and Signal Processing and a PhD in Machine Learning and Signal Processing from University of Delaware. She is a past recipient of the University of Delaware Professional Development Award and uh, received ninth place in the prestigious IEEE GRSS uh, Data Fusion Contest. So the motiva motivation behind this talk today is, um, before we turn it to Shireen, uh, we'll briefly discuss uh, within with you the motivation for her talk. Deep learning algorithms have achieved uh, high performance accuracy in complex domains such as image classification, uh, face recognition, sentiment analysis, uh, text classification, and speech understanding. Due to the nested nonlinear structure of uh, deep learning algorithms, these highly um, successful models are usually applied in black box manner. That is, no information is provided uh, about what exactly causes them to arrive to their pred uh, predictions. The effectiveness of these systems is thus limited by the machine's current uh, inability to explain its uh, decisions and actions to human users. Such a lack of transparency can be a major uh, drawback. It is a very interesting presentation, and we are looking forward to it. To the audience, please post your um, questions in the chat, and we will be asking your questions immediately after the presentation. So we will now turn it over to Sharon. Please take it. Thank you, Ikjo. Thank you, Ali, for the introduction. Good morning to everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening from whichever part you are tuned in. My name is Sharon Matthews, and I am here to present two of my current works. One is on deep fix. And the second part of my work would be on my paper, which is on explainability. So I would like to transition from one work to the other and kind of give you a link of how all of them are intertwined. So to start with deepfakes, like what exactly is deepfake, right? So deepfake refers to synthetic or fake content created using artificial intelligence or machine learning tools. Now they can be audio images or videos that appear to realistically depict human speech and actions, but they are actually synthetic representations created using modern AI tools. With, with what you see in current, with current uh, observations of deepfakes, they are a natural extension of you know, doctored images. These uh, images are so realistically created that it's kind of making people think twice whether seeing is re really believing. And because at the most basic level, these images are quite unsettling. To give an example, I think in today's world, we trust video and audio recordings to, captures, uh, to capture people's word and actions without any kind of bias or misinformation. However, imagine a dark web ep economy where deep fakers might be able to produce misleading content, which can be released to the world to say influence which car you buy or which supermarket you go to. 
Now, deep fakes might touch every area of your life and even basic protection is needed going forward. You might ask why? Because as I said, even at their most basic level, they can be quite unsettling. To give you an example, here are eight images. Can you quickly look over them and say which of them are real or fake? I can give you a minute on it. Believe it or not, all the images on top are fake. They are created by using techniques called StyleGAN, wherein, and this, this images are obtained from this person does not exist. All the images on the bottom are real. They are open from the MIT CDL face recognition database. So this kind of gives you an idea of how realistic looking fake images can be created by using technologies like this. Now, moving on to techniques, like how are these, these can be, how, how uh, deep fakes can be created. Now, one of the early techniques to create deep fakes makes use of computer graphics techniques, right? There are several ways to do that. You can use computer graphics, or you can use fake app, which is like a combination of deep learning and GAN. And then within, within uh, deep learning approaches, there is a GitHub repository called FaceSwap, which is basically uh, do doing a combination of GAN to create fake images. And the third, op the third option is using computer vision, core computer vision techniques. Now, the images that you see on the, on, on the bottom here is the first image is kind of representing a, a, a face swap or an image created in computer graphics, wherein you can clearly see how Steve Buscemi's face is superimposed onto the face of Jennifer Lawrence. So this is an ideal example of identity manipulation, wherein you are kind of swapping the faces. There is no transfer of um, attributes or facial expressions. The image on the on the center and on the right are basically not only swapping, basic not swapping images, but I would say it's more of transfer of facial expressions. A basic understanding of how these deep fakes are created has direct implications on their, I would say, societal consequences and governance. One of the underlying techniques of enabling deep fake creation makes use of GAN or generative adversarial networks. GAN, as the name indicates, makes use of neural networks, right? Neural networks is an important subfield within AI or machine learning. Where basically, it learns in layers to learn complex concepts from lesser complex one. GAN has two neural networks. One is called one is one is the, the one part which is used to create fake images, and the other part which is used to create or analyze or uh, evaluate those created fake images. The word adversarial is basically used because the first neural network, which is called as a generator, is attempting to make images which can ideally uh, fool the other neural network, which is called the discriminator, and essentially make it to think that these images are real. The second neural network, on the other hand, is basically asked to discern whether the images created by the first neural network or the generator is actually real or fake. Now, this discriminator and the generator work alternatively with the generator aiming to improve in each cycle until it can completely fool the discriminator. The image that you see on the right is created using as a part of a paper called Face to Face, which is a CVPR 2016 paper, which makes, mainly uses computer vision techniques for creating these kind of images. Now, how can you detect uh, deep fakes? Now, I mean, as, as you can see, the, the, the images that are created are very realistic. And with the advancement of technology, I think it's more of a, it's more of a, uh, I mean, to keep track of the technology and be, be able to detect it, right? So one of the early techniques that have been used for detecting deep fakes makes use of eye blinking. Now, eye blinking is like a physiological signal that is not very well represented in the synthetic or synthesized fake videos. However, sophisticated forgerers are now able to create realistic looking blinking effects with using post-processing or you know, advanced models. So in the long run, it is advisable to explore more techniques or look at different techniques to detect deep fakes. Next research focused on detecting deep fakes based on inconsistent head poses. This is based on the observation or the ma main inference was deep fakes are created by splicing synthesized face regions into the original image. And in doing so, errors are produced. And we are trying to detect those errors by estimating the 3D head poses from the face images. All these are computer vision based techniques. I will kind of move over the whole area of research as to what's being done. The next work is using uh, facial warping. Basically, they are trying to detect deep fakes or fake images by detecting facial warps or image warping. 
Now, image warping as a concept is basically a process of manipulating an image and use and is used for correcting distortion and actually used for creative purposes when you're trying to, uh, if you have any errors in the image, you try to correct them. So this is kind of using the same thing in reverse order. Now, these works mainly improve, mainly aim to improve the generalization capability by adding an image processing step on top of it before training, right? So one of the most promising techniques that, that has been, uh, one of the most promising recent techniques is looking at artifacts. Like what are the slight artifacts that you see within the image? Do you see a blur or do, do, you, do you see cases where you have an, any kind of illumination invariance or any kind of artifacts in the image and, you, and use those subtle cues to detect uh, any kind of fake content? Now, the most commonly used technique right now makes use of uh, deep learning algorithms, wherein you can make use of VGG, Inception, Exception, or ResNet, those higher level algorithms to detect deep fakes. So this is kind of the broad range of techniques or how techniques have been advanced to detect deep fakes. And if, if I can kind of pinpoint as to what would be the best technique to it, I would say uh, relying on one technique might not always give you uh, the correct detection, you might want to choose an ensemble based model wherein uh, you have a combination of techniques to detect uh, whether the content is a deep fake or not. So what's McAfee doing in this space, right? So what's what's our aim? So our aim is to detect deep fake images and videos by exploiting manipulated content using these cutting edge technologies. Now here is an overview of the entire framework. Now the input to our framework can be an image or a video. And this file can be passed through a detection from format, which is basically a combination of computer vision and deep learning techniques, as I said previously. Now, this computer vision and deep learning technique or the algorithm basically gives us a prediction score indicating a zero or a one. Uh, we have a probability score coming in, which for us, if it's closer to one, it's real. And if it's closer to zero, it's fake. Additionally, we have something like an explainability framework, which helps us to understand why our model gave the prediction it did. So overall, what that explainability framework gives us is helps, helps us to better understand our model. Such informed decisions actually help us to trust our model a little more and provide insights as to how we can use to improve our model's prediction. So this way, we are working on developing futuristic innovation to help authenticate visual media content. And then uh, I would go over in detail on explainability as to how that can be incorporated and how it's applicable, not just for, I would say, image-based detection, but can be applied to a number of domains wherein you make use of machine learning techniques. So I just wanted to showcase a demo of a detection of how a deepfake detection happens. Now, this, this is a fake video of Bill Hader, which was posted on social media recently. And this is a demonstration, what you see here would be uh, the analysis or our script running analysis, which correctly predicts that this video is indeed fake. Now our detection frame, before, before I start running the video, I just wanted to give you a heads up on what to expect. The detection framework divides the video into frames. And whenever you see a green bounding box, it means that a real frame has been observed or the model has detected that frame as a real frame. Now let me, and whenever you see a red frame, that means it's a, a fake image. Let me run the video. To me, and I think he had been briefed on some of this. So, as you see here, we have observed reporting guys, same. but uh, he was like trying to place me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so he sat down next to me. He's like, I. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I love your work. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, Oh, thanks. Uh, I love. So, as you observe, the model keeps giving continuous prediction over frames. And specifically at each frame that you saw where, where, it was a, where it was a stop, you could clearly see the face of uh, uh, Tom Cruise being you know, on top of Bill Hader's image. So you're clearly seeing a case of deep fake, basically the face of Tom Cruise appearing. The chart that you see on the right is basically the probability graph indicating how a model predicts, uh, whether it, for each frame it gives you a prediction indicating whether it's fake or real. So that was the chart on the right. To me. So moving on to the next part, which is part of my paper, which is on explainable AI. Now, this paper was presented last year uh, in a conference where this is a journal paper where I did an extensive analysis on the different explainability methods available or be, be, being available in the research and what is what can be used for different domains. 
right? So XAI, which mainly focuses on, I mean, if, if you have been closely following research, the early work on XAI have been focusing on, say, pixel level explanations using saliency maps. Basically, they seek to explain the predictions by producing some kind of importance graph across each input sample. What I have tried to do in this talk is, or in my paper as well, is try to do an extensive research on the, the area and try to understand how they can be applied within different domains within machine learning. So first of all, why do we need explanations for you know, deep learning, AI, and all those domains? So on a legal side, starting from May 2018, we are obliged to comply with GDPR. Right. So one aspect of GDPR is customer has a right to know, not right to information. He has a right to know how the decision was being made regarding their data. So for companies that deal with, say, automated decision making process, you are ought to provide some kind of information. Uh, you are ought to provide some kind of explanation as to say why a customer was refused a loan or why you were not recruited. Right. But this opened up a debate wherein does this mean that deep learning is illegal? Right. Does it mean that we cannot understand those models? That does that mean that we cannot use it? Now, this opened a various con varied level of conversations on Twitter. Additionally, there was a book uh, by Cathy O'Neill where she mentioned that she calls machine learning models or algorithms weapons of math destruction. She mainly says that they have these three main properties. One, they are opaque. They are unregulated and difficult to contest. Third, they are scalable. Therefore, they amplify any kind of inherent bias to increasingly affect uh, larger populations. Now, according to me, whether it's assessing performance or whether it's kind of making any decision, uh, it's kind of important to understand the model. If as a data scientist, you cannot understand the model, we are at least at a risk at harming vulnerable people and perhaps legal jeopardy. Now, moving in from a more machine learning standpoint, this is a cartoon representing a decision tree. When you have a linear model like this, you can certainly follow certain rules containing that tree and still select a group of class and interpret, OK, why that results came that way or why a particular test sample was you know, classified that way. The problem starts when you look at big data, right? So with big data, uh, you have more dimensions. You have more relationships between your predictor and the outcome variables. And basic ML algorithms that like decision tree, like the one I mentioned, you can quickly follow the path and understand what led to that decision. But when it comes to complex AI algorithms, the deep learning algorithms are often incomprehensible and kind of opaque for, for human intuition, right? So data scientists might have a trouble explaining as to why a particular algorithm gave the decision it did. And the end user might not even trust the machine learning's prediction without any contextual proof or reasoning. So this kind of, I mean, this I would say is a main motivation for me to start researching in this area as to what can be done uh, in terms of adding more explanations into any kind of machine learning framework that you're trying to make use of. So what's what's available or what was available in research so far? So this slide would kind of go over what's what's being there. So on the left that you see here is basically a feature optimization plot, which is like a feature ranking plot. The more higher up uh, the feature is, the more important that feature is. This kind of lends you to the feature importance ranking that you get in random forest or algorithms like that. But if you notice here, what you see here is it's just a ranking of features. The higher up the feature, the more important the feature, right? There is no direction or there is no indication of whether the, whether the, whether the feature supports the prediction or whether it contradicts the prediction. Now, what's, what, what else is available? This definitely gets better with partial dependency plots. Partial dependency plots are basically indicating a relationships of the marginal effect of each of those predictors on the response variable. This is great, definitely. However, we are not able to produce these kind of charts for every classifier that we work with, right? Say you're working with neural network, what do you do? None of them will be able to explain as to why an observation was classified the way it did. Unfortunately, the complexity that gives these deep learning algorithms this extraordinary predictive capability also makes it difficult to understand and trust these models. The algorithms within this black box models do not provide a clear explanation as to why they made a certain prediction. They can give you a probability score, and that way it kind of makes it hard and opaque to inter interpret. Sometimes you within a complex models for deep learning, there are thousands or rather millions of parameters that you tune. There is no one-to-one -one relationships between the input features and the parameters. And often 
combinations of multiple models actually affect the prediction. So it's kind of important uh, to kind of look into that domain as to where explainability can add value. So if you're still not convinced why explainability is matter, this is my final example here. So to further explain the importance of explainability, I would give an example here. This is taken from a paper. I think it's here. Yeah, that's the paper, reference paper. So if I have a model which has a very high accuracy uh, without knowing the mod without knowing what the model is picking up, you do not know whether it's actually a genuine signal or a noise. So just give you an example. The paper kind of aimed at distinguishing between a wolf and a husky. In this example that you see here, it's it gave us like out of the five six cases, five of them were correct. Only one was you know wrong. So you think that okay, it's a decent performing algorithm. What do you do? What what does explainability add value? Let's see. So what explainability gives you is it kind of helps you pick up uh, the important regions or the pixel values, especially in this kind of images. What let the model drive to that decision? So if you look at cases of image of husky, it is actually picking up images or the part of the body from the husky's body or face. But whenever you see the image of wolf, if you notice here, the algorithm is actually picking up snow. That means whenever the algorithm sees snow, it thinks that okay, that's a wolf classifier. That's a wolf class, right? So essentially, what you have built is not an effective husky or a wolf dis distinguisher. You have actually built a very good snow detector algorithm. XAI comes in here. It adds that value to identify the global characteristics learned by your model to discriminate between these classes. And this increased understanding of uh, individual classifiers can be obtained by using X X X X XAI. And I am a big proponent of using explainability working towards responsible AI. Now, what are the use cases, right? So when I started off this research or in my paper as well, I, I did a comparison of what techniques are being available and how how what's best for each, right? If you, if you want to go over, please uh, feel free to read the paper or let me know if you have questions as well. Uh, but what I wanted to kind of present in this talk is uh, XAI is not domain specific, right? You can apply it whatever domain are you working with machine learning classifiers. So I would present a few use cases as to how this can be applied. Uh, I just picked up two. Uh, in my paper, I have a couple more. Uh, so this one talks about a data set that's a biomedical data set, which is a biomedical tumor data set. And the process would be something like this. You have your you have your classification framework. You do your normal data engineering, data, data, data classifier, all that done. And once that is done, you can apply an explainability framework of your choice on top of it to understand the explanations, right? So that's the general flow. So this data set that I chose is a tumor data set, which is, has two classes, malignant and benign. Now, what I'm trying to do is with explainability, I'm trying to provide a classification predictions and at most, and on top of it, I'm trying to generate better information for getting the explanations. So as I said, I followed the normal procedure. I did not go into the feature engineering because I think that that would take, you know, I, I mean, that was not the crux of the talk, if I can say it that way. So I went through the normal uh, data science process where you have your pre-processing, you have your feature engineering, you have your classifiers developed. And for me, I have a comparison of, say, four algorithm, the best performing one, and I have enumerated the ones here. Eight layer deep learning gave us the best accuracy in this case, which had an accuracy of 94%. And hence, I chose that algorithm for this case. And I have some other metrics added here. Some other metrics are added in the paper as well, just for clarity. Once I do my normal data science procedure, I added the LIME framework. So LIME framework is one of the explainability frameworks. Now, uh, if ever you, you, you would like to know, uh, so we have, for if you're working with saliency or if you're working with images, you look for saliency-based methods like good CAM or grad CAM. So those really work for image-based algorithms. But if you're looking at, I would say, text-based data, you can look at algorithms which are perturbations-based or uh, you know, even numerical beta database algorithms. You can look at LIME and D-LIME. There are a number of variations of LIME. LIME, D-LIME, A-LIME, and the norm-LIME, a number of variations of it. And then as the technology advanced, we have game theory-based methods as well, which is SHAP. And it has another variations called, I think, tree -SHAP. Uh, and yeah, so few, few few modifications of each. Like as the research progresses, you have a number of algorithms coming in. So when I performed this research last year, it was mainly focusing on, uh, I mainly focus on the LIME framework and uh, my results portray what I observed from there. So I applied LIME framework and as I said, I was trying to understand 
my explainer functions or whatever I'm trying to do, I'm trying to understand what did my model pick up for classifying. So I have two cases that I'm presenting here. One is the correctly classified cases. My model is correctly indicating that as say benign or malignant. And I'm trying to see what are the features that it is picking up for predicting it. Then I have another use case where I look at the misclassified case. So let's look at what um, am I getting with uh, the class, the correctly classified case. So what you see here is, is a, I would say like a bar chart kind of image. So the green bars indicates that these features, that particular line supports that prediction. Whereas if you see a red bar, it basically indicates that feature contradicts that prediction. So on the left, what you see for a class for benign, you see that it has features like smaller or more regular cells with low value of bare nuclei basically indicate uh, benign cells. Whereas if you have bigger irregular cells with higher value of clump thickness, those are strong indicators of the class malignant. So it kind of gives you an understanding of what features support your prediction and what features contradict your prediction. It gives you substantial improvement in understanding as to how your black box model, in this case, it was an eight layer, eight layer deep learning algorithm works and also helps you, you know, makes you a more educated case, if I can say that way, to which features matter. It gives you a clearer view of the support and the contradiction of the certain words. And if you're only interested in direction and not in the strength, you can just you know modify the framework that way. Now, I think here is the true value or the true power on algorithms like explainability, not just picking online, but usually what's the value on looking at uh, explainability, right? I would say understanding what made your model misclassify something, some, some test sample, right? So all the cases that were predicted or to be benign, uh, all the cases here were predicted to be benign, but they are actually malignant. The reason is they have the features like, you know, small regular cell or and though some malignant characteristics were there, you can clearly observe that they had strong features of, of, of the class which are representing the benign cell. And this, I think, is which can help you to improve your feature engineering and understand how you can improve your feature engineering model to improvise that. Now, since I am from McAfee, I wanted to also apply it for a malware domain and see how that can be applied within, within security domain. So as I said, my aim here was to look at the whole, uh, I mean, the whole area. Like, I'm not focused on just images, though I'm a computer vision you know, researcher or if, if I can, I have my background in PhD in computer vision. So I won't, I won't say that I'm just looking at that area. I wanted to look at a number of areas where you make use of machine learning across the domain. And that's why I applied it to more a signal processing task, something like this, a biomedical signal. And then we look at a malware detection task, the next step. So for malware detection, my aim was to look or demonstrate that explainability does not affect the accuracy and look at uh, any application within malware. You know, for The one I picked up is a Windows PC malware classification. You can look at spam detection, button detection, or whatever is your area of expertise. Now, the procedure still remains the same. Uh, you split your data into correct and incorrect predictions to better comprehend what may have confused your model in terms of misclassification. So the data set that I chose was an open source data set, which was the release at Kaggle, which had roughly 0.5 terabytes of data, which had 20K malware samples. I picked up just two, two classes for ease of understanding and explainability as well. So I picked up two classes, Ramnet and Lollipop. These are uh, malware families, like a particular family of malware that you're trying to predict. So for understanding, it's like a class label. Ramnet is one class label, Lollipop is another class label, right? So in case people are interested as to what feature engineering uh, I made use of, I have enumerated them uh, right here. So there are two common ways of representing malware X view or assembly view. And these are the, I mean, again, I don't want to go in deep in the features, but these are the features that are extracted uh, for developing the model. So moving on to, I would say, the crux again, the, the explainability framework. Now, I, I made use of the same, same procedure. You have a number of algorithms, and I picked up the algorithm that performed the best performance in terms of all the metrics that we chose. And on top of it, I make use of line framework, which basically helps me to understand or look at the clues that the classifier is trying to pick for correctly, uh, for correctly predicted case. And also, I look at the incorrectly predicted case in the next slide. Now, what does this reveal, right? So if you recall previously, the green bars basically indicate that those features support my prediction and the red bars basically indicate that those features contradict my prediction. So we have two classes here. 
And the result of the explainer function indicates that the features called section name header num sections, they basically clearly are strong proponents or indicate class ramnet. Whereas if you have features from environment strings or string type or global allocation based features, they are um, strong features corresponding to the class lollipop or the second class, right? Now, a PE file consists of certain predefined sections, uh, more technically, I would say, like .txt, .bss. The feature section name uh, or num sections are for different characteristics uh, from the section feature. Now, I think, again, the true power of explainability framework is reiterated by, again, looking at cases where the model made mistake. Now, if you notice, I have a pretty good accuracy in this case. I only had one misclassification. And if you recall for my Ramnet classes, remember, I have features like section name and num sections, which are like strong indicators of that particular class. So let's look at the misclassified case, right? So this is the example uh, where I have a misclassification. And this is what my results look like. So this class is being predicted as Ramnet, where it's actually belonging to the other class. And if you can see, it had a very strong feature or a strong support variable from that feature named section name header, which is a very a representative feature for Ramnet class. Now, I think this is helpful as it helps you to not only categorize or it does not affect your machine learning approach or the classification, but also explains you why uh, the algorithm or the prediction what was made that they, the way it did. So hopefully, uh, like overall, I wanted to kind of go over both the domains, like uh, mainly on explainability, like how explainability can be used across the domain. And to start with, I wanted to also present my work on a deep fake and how explainability can come and uh, play a part in, in that area of research as well. So in conclusion, I hope this session was informative and you were able to learn at least about deep fakes as to how bad actors can create deep fakes and what are the implications of that technology. I also aim to cover the underlying technology that can be used to create deep fakes. Now, deepfakes will be a viable method for social media companies uh, to reduce disinformation in 2020 which is important, I would say, not only due to elections, but also due to awareness of deepfakes are kind of quite low. Now, with the threat landscape changing so much, deepfakes might reach ultra-realism ultra in the next few years, and uh, many few might still be immature-ish and maybe still be able to detect. And on the second part, I hope that you were able to get some insights on few techniques that can be used uh, on explainability and how they can be applied uh, you know, across the domain being any classification task uh, that, that you're working with. So what I wanted to kind of go over was to un, uh, kind of infer that XAI can help you to understand your black box model or any feature engineering uh, or machine learning algorithm that you're working with. And they can be applied to any areas. They can be applied to uh, maybe face detection algorithm or face classification, or you're working with NLP-based data or even malware data set. So the applications are quite varied. Thank you. So that sums up. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Appreciate it. And uh, uh, we'll uh, just go ahead and now turn over to the audience uh, portion and the Q and A portion of this uh, session. Um, so I'll I'll start with maybe the, the first question is more of a arguing the uh, the need for an explanation or uh, in the in the sense of. Are we holding our models to a higher standard than we're holding ourselves at? Because many human decisions sometimes are not explainable. So more of a, uh, what are your thoughts on, are these models being held to account at a higher standard than we're holding ourselves? So uh, I would put it this way that, you know, uh, as a data scientist, you, you end up working with a different number of models. So what explainability gives you is the added amount of trust into your model. Uh, you do not want to trust your model blindly. So that's 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 essentially what you, you want. To, you don't want to end up doing, right? So you, using frameworks like explainability can help you increase your trust in the model and also help you increase the, the feature engineering. You can go back and do more of a reverse engineering and see if your feature engineering was correct and help and understand whether you can remove certain features or you can add better features to improve your model's decision. So I would say uh, it is going to be supplementing what you're trying to do, but not blindly trusting your model here. Okay, thank you, Sharon, for that answer. Uh, now, the second question we have here is, uh, are there uh, benchmark data sets uh, for deep fake detection where we're measuring uh, all of the effectiveness of our 
deepfake detection algorithms against a benchmark data set that you can potentially point us to? Sure. So uh, this research, I think, happened this year. Uh, many companies, I mean, uh, are working on detecting deepfakes. And there is an open research, I think, called DFTC Challenge, which was released at Kaggle, uh, which was looking at detecting deepfakes. Uh, I think the paper is out as well. And people are looking at different schemes or different techniques to detect deepfakes. Yes. And with that being said, uh, there are other, I mean, if you're looking at deep fakes in video, that's one data set. And there are uh, other data set with images also, which you can look in for detecting deep fakes in just images based data. OK, beautiful. Um, now, uh, one of the challenges with some of these uh, explanation methods like Lime is they are non-deterministic. They're not stable. They would give you a different explanation the, if you ran that explanatory model on the same instance. Uh, is that something that you ran into in maybe your experiments and uh, potentially uh, an issue that you had to address? Yeah, I think it's a great question. So uh, I, I would kind of cater um, explainability algorithms into buckets, uh, cases where they work well, uh, where they don't work well. So recent paper uh, by Fong, I think it was in 2020, maybe very recent, July, uh, they kind of Com not compared, but I, I kind of figured out that uh, th there were algorithms which are very specifically working well for certain cases. So if you're working with algorithms like Lime, Lime basically proposes a model agnostic method with, say, traditional machine learning ideas and interprets the prediction uh, by fitting a small, I would say, local linear model. Now, this local linear model might not be able to handle the millions or the weights of millions of data, which might lead to underfitting, right? So therefore, uh, they might simplify the input sampling method to uh, from, from a pixel level model uh, to a super pixel level mode, which might result in a coarse level or a less accurate saliency map. So basically, if you make use of Lime for image-based classification, you can observe that it's a coarse-based graph and it's basically less accurate. Same can be observed with techniques like GradCam. Now, GradCam essentially only works on the last layer. Uh, it does not produce meaningful saliency maps at any other layer except the last layer, right? So there are a number of techniques, I would say, that can be used to improve these frameworks. You can use something like a class sensitivity metric, uh, which can help you. You are basically increasing, uh, you are basically increasing the sensitivity with layer-wise and offering explanations within each layers. GradCam specifically, I would say, averages the backpropagation by taking a product uh, within the activation. But using technologies like adding some kind of sensitivity metric can help you to improve uh, each of those methods. Like, I mean, that research is ongoing, but there, there are some future areas that can be explored in this. OK. Um, now, uh, the, the other question here is, uh, si uh, with the explanations being in the form of, uh, for, for visual, for uh, uh, type data, uh, saliency maps where we're highlighting an, an area of uh, the particular image that was used in making the decision. Uh, any thoughts on how that uh, would, uh, how those explanations are maybe not particularly useful for uh, attacks that are uh, all about just perturbing an image with changing a few pixels on the image? I mean, the. So, so yeah, so uh, we, we have in the literature examples in which you're able to change a few pixels on the image and come up with it completely different explanations. And, and even though an explanatory method might highlight a region of that image, if those pixels are not visible to a human being, how could we potentially benefit from those explanations if we're not able to, to see those pixel changes or we're not sensitive enough to those pixel changes? Okay. So essentially, for XA, I mean, I have seen cases like this, right? So uh, th there are cases where uh, I think it's, it's called the tiger cat example where GradCam has not been performing well. Now, uh, the process of generating a saliency map is basically split into two phases. One is the contribution of the gradient of that network parameter at each spatial locations. And then you aggregate into a 2D heat map. Um, so with GradCam or linear appro approximation techniques, I think uh, I, I haven't seen work which are uh, clearly pro proposing of properly aggregating combinations from different convolutional layers. There is a work called, I think, norm grad or something. It's a very recent paper, which basically uses Frobenius norm for aggregation. So that's another line of work which makes use of combinations from different layers for making explainability results. But as I said, excellency maps mainly focus on pixel level explanations, makes use of uh, kind of you're trying to explain the prediction by looking at importance graph. 
but i think there is still scope uh, i mean areas where that can be improved here okay okay uh, in, i have a question yeah so uh, like explainability can be a really good useful really useful in cybersecurity and you mentioned one of the question uh, one of the domain is for the malware mm -hmm. and can you suggest some other areas or line of work uh, which uh, which will be uh, really useful to use the explainability and you might have seen that work or in cybersecurity domain yeah, so I think uh, what I explored here was looking at uh, Windows PC malware classification. I think you can use that for Android PC mal Android classification, malware classification. You can use it for uh, spam detection, like Lime works well even for uh, NLP based text data. Uh, if you have data de dealing with tweets and you're trying to detect uh, the classification prediction on that and uh, so basically, if you're working with like text-based data, also you can make use of explainability framework like spam detection or bot detection. So that's in the area of cybersecurity. Additionally, you can explore. I mean, I think that there is definitely work on this, but uh, you can definitely explore it for just plain text classification. Say for deep fake, I have used it for uh, in, uh, detecting or explaining the the results, right? So that can be explored to other domains, say text classification and image recognition as well. Would you be able to share some insight on how we can use uh, explainability specifically for threat modeling or risk assessments? Uh, because that would be really good use if we can do that. So uh, in mm -hmm. terms of features as well, like because I remember you mentioned a few things, a uh, mm -hmm. few features as well. So if you can tie them. So I can kind of pinpoint, pinpoint this example. So this example that I uh, took in mainly was looking at only, I would say, Windows PC malware classification or malware detection problems, right? So you have a set of features that you uh, do more of feature engineering uh, to come up with an ex to come up with a prediction. What XAI can help you understand or improvise is look at that feature engineering that you have, uh, you know, curated, and see if I mean if there is a way you can improve your results and see if your feature engineering. I mean, you you might have hundred features. I'm just giving an example here. This is not realistic or applicable to this case. But you, you might have a case where you have uh, 100 features being curated. And then you, you, you can go back and look at your feature engineering and see whether, whether all those features are important. Are you looking at a combination of features? Does those combination of features give you a better result? So basically, using uh, explainability, it can help you direct to a particular direction as to which features can be used for improving your, I would say, classification model or uh, you know what, what did not help you as such in your feature engineering. So that's the domain that I have been kind of focusing on. Are there any challenges when you are specifically looking for, because I'm not thinking about the data sets for malware, or when you are looking in cybersecurity domain, these things are you actually detecting in first place and you have to identify. So you, how would you work around with that? I think yeah, for, um, I would say cybersecurity domain, I think knowing the area is important. Like I think one thing which I, which I have realized is when you work with computer vision, right? Uh, you can visually see what's happening. So I think having an in-depth knowledge of that domain is uh, important to kind of backtrack and understand whether inclusion. Yes, yes, that that's right. So that that having having that explanation or having that uh, understanding of your domain is important to redirect or help you improve your understanding of what explanation is given. So you might want to collaborate with someone who is more of a security researcher and can help you uh, infer that what you found is actually correct or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so are there any uh, data sets or benchmark um, data sets for the, in these? Like you uh, explicitly mentioned about the Windows PC malware. So, so, this, uh -huh. so you have yeah, any references? Okay, so I think, uh, I, I mean, I haven't explored open source data sets, but much for this domain, I mainly was looking at malware detection. This is an open source data set available at Kaggle, uh, which was released, I think, by Microsoft in 2015 as part of a big data challenge. Uh, so this is one of the data sets. Uh, I think there are a number of data sets available on Kaggle, which is mainly looking on cybersecurity. That's your that's what you're mainly essentially looking on. You can look for spam detection uh, task or spam detection problems, and even a botnet classification problems. There should be a number of data sets available on Kaggle, which which kind of look at classification tasks, but you might have to uh, add explanations on top of it to understand that domain better. Mm -hmm. So would you see uh, explainability as the additional? task or 
is it something you see as, as a necessary task i think it is necessary as well as an additional task i think but it it one thing to understand is it's not uh, affecting your model anyway right you are improving your model's prediction so you are able to understand what your model picked up while classifying it so i would say i, I mean if, if you if you saw my whole framework when i was doing the the use case demonstration i go through the normal pipeline i go through my feature engineering i go through my classification and then i add explanations so it's not affecting my accuracy or whatever i'm doing you are basically adding a layer of understanding onto your model so that is essential that is essential at least for a data scientist like me right you you can look at your model and understand okay what did your model pick up and how you can better improve your engineering so i would say it's both an additional layer and also it's a necessary layer at least for a data scientists to understand this domain okay ali do you have more questions uh, no i think that that was great uh, appreciate uh, our is there any final thoughts that Shireen wants to uh, uh, share with us before we wrap this up? No, I think uh, thank you for all the questions. Uh, and I think this was my first time presenting and it was a great session here. So feel free to email me or reach out to me if you have any questions on explainability. And I, I would be happy to provide directions if I can on how explainability can be added or how it can be used for different domains. Uh, so yeah, thank you again. OK. So uh, next, I'll uh, do a quick summary of uh, the presentation, and then I'll turn it over to Exit for uh, to close the session. Uh, the high level is deep picks are becoming more pervasive and uh, represent opportunities uh, for a broad spectrum of uh, vect vectors of attack. Uh, explanations uh, require are required to comply with uh, possible regulatory compliance and trust the model, debug it, and improve it. And the value of explanation is particularly interesting uh, in case when the model comes up with the wrong prediction. Uh, Sharon presented a number of uh, very interesting use cases uh, related to deepfakes and, and other uh, data sets as well. Uh, I will now turn it over to uh, Exit to uh, close the session. Thank you, Ali. I thank you, Sharon, for this great presentation. And we all thank uh, who joined us online. To see more free content like this, visit our website at ai.science and log in to access slides from this and other sessions. Also, make sure you subscribe our YouTube channel, ML Papers Explained, to get notified about all the live sessions and other free content we publish. This concludes our event. Thank you for watching.